Do you have your Bible? Take it and turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. And if you don't have a sermon outline, just uh, lift your hand and these kind gentlemen will be glad to give you one. In the life of our church, we study the Bible verse by verse. And um, as we do that, uh, we do it with uh, the help of some notes in order for us to be able to remember what we studied and place it all together as we go. We welcome you this morning to the Word of God. It is no secret that I am not a cook. Um, There's some things I can do, but there's some things I cannot do. And uh, it it, it just doesn't work out for me uh, to cook. Um, How many of you tend to be a cook of some sort? You enjoy, you kind of enjoy sometimes. I know that Larry does. I know that Ricardo does. And we have some great chefs in our church. I think about Chris Hughes. I think about uh, Gail Durrett. I think about my wife. Um, There are so many that are great cooks. And then there's some of us that are rather clueless, and you don't want us to do that. Um, Because we might leave out a key ingredient, or we might have things out of balance in the process. Marcy and I were in New Mexico seeing her parents um, in a high altitude uh, place where they have a house. It's a, and you know, it's funny, it's as if cooking is not hard enough um, under normal circumstances, but some of you know that if you actually go to a higher altitude, everything changes. Um, Things cook differently at a higher altitude. I just heard this week about somebody who was cooking with the Nistors. I believe it was... um, Evan and, or, or Ivan and Danette, they said they had brought all of this food up there to cook a Puerto Rican meal for Ben and Esther in North Carolina, and at the high elevation, the rice did not work out. They scooped it all up, threw it in the can, and went to a restaurant. So, you have to have the right plan. Well, the Lord has given us the right plan for the life of the church. He's given us the right ingredients, and there is a very, very key ingredient that if you do not have this ingredient, you do not truly have a church. And one of those key ingredients is abounding love. And it's abounding love not only for God, but also one another. In fact, we saw Jesus' words that would be when they came to him and they said, what is the greatest commandment trying to trap him? Because if he elevated one commandment over the other commandments, that he would be seen as a heretic. And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you didn't ask for it, but the second commandment is like it. It is to love your neighbor as yourself. And with this, they could not argue. To love God and to love one another, this is his plan. He made us to love him. He made us in such a way to love those that are around us like he loves those that, are, that he has made. And so we come to this key ingredient for a true church, and we see it right here over and over and over again in this little letter of Philippians. And I want you to notice the box on the page. We've already studied verses 1 through 7 today. Look where we're going to go. Over halfway down in the box on your page, we're going to go 8 through 11. But as so often is the case, you need to read the context in order to understand the true meaning. And so we will read again what we've already studied and what Joe has even prayed in these last few moments. But I want you to see this great and glorious ingredient that is so prevalent in this letter. Look what he says in verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Look at verse 5. Because of your partnership, underline the word partnership, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So he said, I thank God for you. Look at verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And here we go again. Look at this, verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You see, this is love language. This is the affection of God in him for them. 
Look what it says. Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers, underline that word again, partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you. Here it is again. The affection, the thinking of them, remembering them, thanking God for them. And now we see how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ. And it is my prayer that your love, would you circle those two words, your love. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may prove what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Notice number one in our review, Paul is writing from a prison in Rome. He's on death row. He's going to be put to, he's going to, be put to death very shortly to the Philippian church. He's writing to them from a prison, and the Philippian church was a church that he had planted several years earlier, so he hadn't seen them in a while, but look at number two, the Philippians had stayed connected to Paul in prayer and in support and correspondence. We see that not only in this letter, but in other letters. They were continuing to relate to one another, even though they were separated by hundreds of miles and even a jail cell. Look at number three. The entire letter centers around, fill it in, the joy, the joy they share in the deep fellowship of knowing Christ. Now, we've been talking about this issue of deep fellowship because it's, it's the language of this letter is laden with something that is more than just a mere friendship. It's more than just uh, similar likes that we enjoy. This is talking about, I had you understand, underline those words, the word partnership. And what's the other word I had you underline? Partaker. Right out there to the side of, of both of those, koinonia, because that is the root word of both of those words. That you have shared in my sufferings. You have shared in the gospel. You have shared in the work. And so we we begin to see, and it unfolds all the way through the letter, that this is a very deep relationship. And folks, this is important for us in 2019. This is important for Sheridan Hills. This is important for your life, for us to see what God shows us in his word is the design for Christians and how they are to relate to one another. So number three is this, this shows the joy even though Paul's in prison, and even though these Philippians are under great pressure, they're under economic problems, they're in famine, and they're in persecution, and yet they're talking about joy coming out of the midst of their circumstances. Look at number four. This is a love letter. Make no mistake about it. This is a love letter, not between a couple, but it's between a preacher, a church, and a savior. Fill those in. It's between a preacher, a church, and a Savior, because ultimately, all Scripture is inspired by God. So, God has given us this letter through the Apostle Paul, but we see that God uses the writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament. He uses their abilities, their personalities. He uses their experiences. He uses these things as the Holy Spirit gives to us what we need to hear and to know about God. And so we see this beautiful love letter. Now, I want you to think about this throughout this message and in fact throughout even the whole letter, this analogy is here. You see the two triangles on the, on the page here. The first part, triangle on the left is kind of the, the, the diagram or the picture of a husband and a wife's relationship as a Christian. Um, it, is, it is really God's design that a husband and a wife be there, you see at the bottom of the triangle, husband and wife there, and, and that God is in this relationship. You say, wow, I've heard about love triangles, but not like in this sense. Uh, oh, this is better, a lot better than the other one, believe me. In fact, that is Satan's lie. Satan's lie is always to turn it. Satan's lie is always to destroy it. Satan's lie is for there always to be a threat. 
And so here what we see, the true love triangle is the one where God is the, is the, the maker of this relationship. He's the foundation of this. That he, he has designed this. Even for people who do not know the Lord, they still benefit. They benefit greatly from God's good design. So they may not know God personally, but to the degree that they live according to what God has designed, they find good things and blessings. And this is why that you can go outside the church and you can go out here in Hollywood and you will find not a lot, but you will find some marriages that are very beautiful and that are very honoring and very good. And that is because God's design is very good. And to the degree that they embrace that design and that they embrace what it takes for a husband to love a wife and a wife to love a husband, they find even unwittingly the blessings and the beauty of God. Does that make sense? So it's very, to the degree that we honor God's design, we experience many, many blessings. But notice here with me that the real picture is that God has designed us to know Him too. Well, I want you to notice these arrows. To the degree that you see down there at the bottom, as you go up and as your life moves up in the process of life and in your relationship with your husband or your wife, it is God's design that you would get closer to each other as you're closer to God. And there's many people who have expressed that even in the life of our church. They say, you know, man, I've started growing spiritually. And it's kind of weird. When my wife and I are here at church, there's actually some aspects of this that cause us to be much closer as a couple. And we go, praise God. That ought to be the case. That as we grow closer to God, we grow closer to each other. And as we grow closer to each other, we're more and more in the position to be able to recognize God's goodness in his design. Well, here's something that some of you have never really thought about before. Some of you have never realized that you can truly love the church. That church isn't just something you do. It's just not, you know, a part of your life. But It's actually designed by God to own a portion of your heart and for you to be so invested and so so affected that you could write a letter like Paul. Look at verse 3 where he says, I thank my God in every remembrance of you. That sounds like a love letter, doesn't it? Miss you, miss you, miss you. Gosh, I miss you, girl. All the, you know, I love that, hit, that, that uh, poem, Amidst the Busy World. You're on every corner, every turn and twist, every old familiar spot whispers how you're missed. I used to quote that to Marcy when I would be away from her and we were dating. I, I, I missed her. And then I would go on these long trips to Africa. I'd be stuck down there. She was up with the girls in France. It wasn't safe, it wasn't safe at that time for her to move into the country. The country was in civil war. And I'd be down there running around. And after a few days, I just wasn't really very good um, because I missed Marcy. Um, this, is, this is the picture that you see with Paul. Look what he says in verse 3. I thank my God in my remembrance of you, always in my prayers. He goes on to say, he said, verse 7, it's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. Then he goes on to say, verse 8, for God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. You see, this this is a picture of a man who loves a group of people, and he loves them to the glory of God. I hope and pray this morning, even as we look at these verses and as we look at this, that you will recognize that as Paul loved the Philippian church and many other churches, and as we look at the example of Christ this morning, that Christ loved us so much that he laid down his life for us, that God has designed it for you to love your church. God has designed it for you to love the family of Christ, 
for you to love the individuals in the church? You say, all of them? Well, I know what you mean. Um, but yeah, all of them. Hey, you're going to be closer to some than others. But God has designed it, and we see it in the example of Paul, and we see it in the example of Jesus, that a right relationship with God brings the possibility of right relationship with others. So it's me and my church and our Savior. And the closer we get to the Savior, the closer we get to one another. So as the church grows in maturity in Christ, as the church grows in its spirituality, and as you as an individual in the church grow in your maturity and in your spirituality, what comes out of that is a closeness and an intimacy that was not there before. This is God's design. It's God's design that we would truly be in love with him and with one another in all of the appropriate means of his grace for us. And that is what we see in the Apostle Paul. Now, I want us to focus on verse 9 for just a moment here. Look at verse 9 with me, and I'd like to ask you to read it out loud together with me. So, just kind of clear your throat. Here we go. Get ready. Verse 9. Let's read it together. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Now, you've already focused the word love because that is really the focus of what this is all about. He's saying that your love, and what should your love be like? And we see this here at the bottom of the page. What kind of love should a church have? Well, this verse tells us that. The first part that we see is that it should be increasing. This love should be a love that is increasing. Notice the scripture that's on the screen in front of you. Look what it says. And it's my prayer that your love may do what? abound more and more. So, you know, when you talk about something abounding, being bountiful, that's what it's doing. It's overflowing, that it's going to grow. It's going gonna, it's gonna to keep getting larger and larger. It's going to keep going. And fill this in. Notice this, that true love grows. If it's not true love, it's not going to grow. If it's true love, it's going to grow. And that is, in, that is in many different aspects of our life and of our heart. Imagine how absurd and scandalous it would have been if yesterday our own sweet Krista Baird said, yes, Jordan, I will love you up to a point. I, I do to that, but I'm not sure I'm going to love you past that point. You would say, well, they're obviously not ready to get married if that's where she's at, right? Right? But that's not what she said. She's committed her life and her heart to to growing in her love for Jordan throughout the rest of her life, throughout the rest of this. That is the picture of what everybody here would take. No, there's no end and limit to where we're to love. It's the idea is that the, the longer that you live with your loved one, the longer that you are married to your spouse, that that love should grow. The, the longer you have with your children, the longer that you see who they are and that you, as time goes on, it is God's design that your love for them would grow. And it's God's design that your love in the life of the church would continue to grow. You know, there are some people who have just kind of said, maybe in, the, in their marriage, that's, you know, that's just kind of where I end. And their love begins to grow cold as soon as that happens. As soon as they determine limits on how unselfish they're going to be, and they say, well, I'll be unselfish up to this point, that's when the love relationship begins to weaken and actually falter. But true love not only grows, true love deepens. And not only does it deepen, but true love overflows. That's part of the picture that is here. And that's what we see Paul praying for. I pray that your love would abound more and more and that it would abound in a few things as well. So it would abound in general, but it also would have some other qualities to it. Look at number two here. It says that the love of the church and its members should be not just increasing, but it should be informed. 
And this is, we, we see this in the verse. Notice the verse, what it says. Notice the, the words that are in red there um, as we see. It says, with knowledge, that your love would abound more and more with knowledge. Here's the, here's the deal. This is what this means for you and for me. True love knows. That's what it does. It knows the object of the love. You see, the, when, a, when a young couple is getting to know one another and they're, they're growing together in their, in their relationship, they're learning about one another. Now, what can happen is, as after a while, um, you can kind of think, ah, I know them. I know them completely. There's nothing about that man that I do not know. You could say, as a wife that's been married for 50 years, I can tell you what he's going to say. I can tell you what he's going to do. I know him. But you know, the fact of the matter is, is that we change as we grow. And if we're Christians and we're growing in life and we're maturing, we're always in this process of a, a metamorphosis in Christ, that we are continuing to become more and more of who God has called us to be. And so, a true relationship that is in true love and is true growing is continuing to learn about this other person, to know them. This is why it's so important in the life of our church that we would come to know one another. You cannot love someone you do not know. I mean, you, you, there is a degree that you can do that, but if it comes down to a relationship where it is a ongoing relationship, you must know them. And as you get to know them, the love deepens. And that is certainly true in a marriage, but it's also true in a church. And apply it to God. You see, the more you learn of God, if you're studying the Bible and growing to know how He is and what He does, and you, you learn His ways, you come to know Him. There's some people that say, you know, I have a real heart problem. I really don't love God. Y'all talk about loving God. And I just can't relate to that. I don't, I really don't love God. Well, my question would be, well, how much do you know of God? Do you, do you just know about Him a little bit? Do you just know enough to be dangerous? Or do you come to know Him? And that's about exactly what the Apostle Paul was bent on. The Apostle Paul said, it is my goal to know him, and even in the power of his sufferings, to relate to him, that I may become more like him. And so we see this in the life of the church. You see, knowledge, fill this in, knowledge increases capacity to love. When you know someone better, you can love them deeper. You can love them more. And that's part of what the Apostle Paul is saying to the Philippian church. It's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge, knowledge of God, knowledge of each other, knowledge of the truth. When you walk in the truth and you know the truth and you know about someone, you can apply it and there is a deeper, more significant love. Number three, we also see this and it's this. Number three, the love of the church and its members should be insightful. The idea is here, it's not blind, it's not, it's not really, not just naive, but, but, but just ignorant. It is insightful. Notice this, that love sees, that's what it does. One of the most important things that God's Word says to us over and over again is that God sees us, He knows us. And that allows us to see, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of accountability with that. Yes, there is accountability with that. But let me tell you, it is a wonderful thing when the God of heaven sees you in your despair and in your pain. And you know that he is good. And he says, I am with you. And he knows you and you're suffering. The question is, do you see him? You see, this is with insight, that true love grows in insight. Now, all three of these so far, that it's increasing, it's formed, and it's insightful. Let me tell you, that the true flesh and the true way of the world, the way of Satan, is not about increasing in love. It's about love growing cold. It's not about being informed. Satan wants to keep you as stupid to the things of God that he can. Because he knows if you learn more of God, you're going to love him more. And you're going to be wise to his ways. And that's why I'm so proud of you for being here this morning, that you're coming and saying, I want to I know God. I want to know what the Bible says so I can 
walk with God. I, I hope that that's your heart. But as that happens, you will have insight to what is going on, and you will have insight into the life of the church. So, perceiving reality accurately, which is what God's Word helps us do, and His Spirit helps us do, perceiving reality accurately increases intimacy. He's saying, I hope that that your love will abound more and more with knowledge and with insight. And the insight is that you're perceiving things accurately. And as that happens, there is true intimacy between you and God and you and the people that are around you. This is God's grand design. Now, this next section on the second side is going to be a mind blower a little bit. And there's so much more you could, you could preach for days on this. I'm almost going to simply read this, and I want you to go and think about this um, uh, at a later time, uh, maybe this afternoon, this evening. And I'm, I'm praying that I will sow some seeds here for you to understand God's love in a much deeper way than you've ever understood it before. Now, up there on the top, again, I want you to circle in verse 9, love, the word love. Now, the word love that is in this verse 9 is the word agape. There's a few different words that are translated into English as love. Agape is one of them, and agape is one of the most unique words in the Bible. And what I mean by that is you don't see the word agape in other forms of literature in other things. This is a love that is, listen to this, look right here for just a minute. This is a love that is most defined by how does the father love the son? That, if you want to know what agape means, look at how the father loves the son and how the son loves the father. Because that is perfect agape. That is perfect love. And we see that that love that we see over and over again in the Bible is also given to us. So this is the way in which God perfectly loves his children. So if you wonder, what does love mean? Well, just go study to what God does and what he says about his love for us. This is why we should study the Bible. This is why you should learn the narrative of the Bible, that that you're understanding of who God is and what he does will be much clearer. Notice here with me, in fact, God even defines himself by this. In 1 John it says, for God is love. That is who God is. Now, notice this and fill this in. The word love or agape, it literally means to prefer or to choose. To prefer or to choose. And what do we mean by that? A discriminating, fill this in, this is a discriminating affection that involves choice and selection. So this is discriminating against another that is there before, and it says, this is my choice, this is my selection, this is the one I want. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than this, but how many times have you gone into a beautiful bakery? I mean, you know, we lived in France, and French bakeries are unlike anything in the world, I just have to tell you. Um, it's amazing. You go in there, you see this big glass case, and there's all of these things, the patisserie, and you go look at all of these different patisseries there, and man, you know, it, it, you go to select one. Well, that, that's, that's one aspect of this, but it's far more than that. It's not because of anything beautiful within itself. It's simply because you have chosen this. And that is the most important thing for us to see here. Why would it involve choice and selection? And and somebody would say, well, why this one? God, why this one? And God is right to say, just because. This is my choice. It's almost as if if for no other, other reason, then that is, it is my choice. Because you see, when we really study God and we really see who God is, he is the sovereign one that can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and all of his ways are perfect and just, and he has this glorious right to say, this one. Now, even more mind-blowing is the next part here. 
This should not be confused with randomness. God does not randomly choose his will or randomly choose his children. No, you see, there is, fill it in, there is a reason. But that reason, interestingly enough, does not come from within that which is being loved or what is being loved. So it's not because of the intrinsic value within itself. It is because of the sovereign choice of God for his purposes that he alone knows. And by this, he chooses us. We, we would say it is not the character of the chosen. So it is, it is simply this picture, fill this in, the choice is driven by the will and purposes of the chooser, not the character of the chosen. Because friends, if that was true, Andrew Coleman would never be loved. Because I am flawed, and let me tell you, that you would be never, never be loved because you were flawed. But this is why so many have called agape love unconditional love. This is the way God loves us, and this is the way God empowers us and teaches us to love others. And we see it in Deuteronomy chapter 7. You can see hints of it all the way back there. You see it very plainly in Romans chapter 9, that God says, this is what I have chosen, this is what I have done. But, but notice this idea that he doesn't love us because we are so lovely. In fact, to the contrary of that, we see, look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And, the love, and love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, it's not that we love God first, so he loved us. This is God loving us in spite of the fact that the Bible makes very clear that we have made ourselves enemies of God. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. God demonstrates, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and here it is, and underline this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So you see, it's not because of who we are, it's in spite of who we are that God loves us. This is the glorious gospel of God in Christ Jesus that though we deserve to be cut off from God, that he loves us and he loves us freely. Now, there are two important caveats about agape love. Number one, God's perfect love and wisdom informs our love. So if you want to know how to love someone, see how God loves. Then you learn how to really love. And this is part of the reason the world struggles so much with loving well, because they don't see the depth and the glory of what God has said. And even Christians, Christians can be ignorant to what God's Word really says. But if we study Philippians, and we study the kind of love that Christ has, I mean, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2, where Jesus lays down his life because of his love for us. We see in Romans chapter 5, Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8, all of this picture that God says this is what love looks like. That one lays down his life for his friends. And so we see this glorious picture. It informs us on how to love. Notice the statement that is here. For the Christ follower, as verse 9 indicates, his or her love is to be informed and perceive and um, perceptive based upon what God says about everything, including all that is right and all that is wrong. And from that, the Christ follower knows what to love and what not to love. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, don't love the world, love God. And so the Christ follower is told by God how to love. This is what informs our love, and that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here. Notice this, number two, another important caveat about agape love is this, God's perfect love in, in, and his spirit empowers our love. You cannot love like God loves without him. It is impossible. 
But with him, you can love like he loves. This is an amazing concept in Romans chapter 5, and specifically in verse 5, it says, for the Holy Spirit, the, excuse me, the love of God is poured out within our hearts, which means he's given us all of it. He's poured out within our hearts the ability to love through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so in Romans chapter 5, it says, that boss that drives you nuts that you think there's no way I can love him, God is saying, my spirit in you can love him. Corey Ten Boom, after World War II in the Holocaust, her, her father and her sister were killed in one of the concentration camps because they had helped Jews escape. And she recognized one of the guards from the camp after the war was over when she was speaking at a church. And she recognized his face and she knew that he was one of the guards that was there in the camp where her sister, her beloved sister, died in front of her. And she said, oh Lord, oh Lord, I know him, I see, I see him, I know exactly who he is. And she cried out for the help she said, I know I'm going to walk up this aisle, and he wants to come shake my hand. And Lord, I, I can't do this. And she said, it was the power of God that gave her the strength to look at him, shake his hand, and forgive him for what he did to her father and her sister. And she came to find that he was a Christian she came to find that he had heard the gospel, that he had been saved from the gospel, out from even his murderous scheme in what he did and what he obeyed, what he aided in things. And so we, we begin to see that even the love of God poured into us is what gives us the strength to love like God loves. And that's what the Apostle Paul is getting at here. May your love abound more and more in the church and for God with knowledge. Grow in your knowledge of how he works and what he said and what he's done. Grow in your discernment so you can accurately assess, not act like things aren't there, but you can truly come to love as God loves. What are the results? We see it in verse 10 and 11. I want you to see verse 10 at the top of the page and verse 11. Look what it says in verse 10 and 11. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of the righteousness that comes through Christ. You see, it's all coming from Christ to the glory and praise of God. What are the result, or what is the result of growing, informed, perceptive, those come from verse 9, growing, informed, perceptive love? What are that? Or what, what, are, those, what are those results? Number one, first of all, it's godly living. You're going to live a life that honors God. Approve what is excellent. You see, this means that you begin to live not just for that which is quote-unquote good in your, in your mind or that which is better maybe than the world around you. You don't just start comparing yourself to the world around you. Christians can do that, and we shouldn't do that. We don't need to say, oh, well, we're, you know, we're living at a different level than everybody around us. You know, we must be really great or something. That, that is, is, is a very insidious pride that is not of God. Instead, what we start to do is we start to compare ourselves to the glory of Christ and in all our ways to acknowledge Him. And so we don't just choose something that's good or better, but we choose God's best. We need to start to choose God's best in our lives. The books that we read, the movies that we watch, the things that we spend our time, where we spend our money, how we speak to one another, how we love one another. What has is, what is God said is the best way to relate to others? and to relate to the world. He says, don't love the world, love him. Love his kingdom, love that which is eternal, not the things that are passing away. And so this is what it means to approve what is excellent. All the things of God are excellent. And, and notice there, he doesn't say to approve that which is just good. It's saying excellent. That's what points us to the nature and the, and the call of God. Notice this, love can be known only by the action it produces. 
And that's by James Strong made that statement from the Strong's Concordance and the Strong's Dictionary. He says, love can only be known. It, it is known only by the action it produces. Here's, here's the idea here. Love is more than mere words. Love is more than mere sentiment. Love is seen by what you do. It's more than a feeling. It's more than a thought. It may involve a feeling. It may involve a thought. It may involve a word. But love is only known by the action that is truly said. That's when you know it is there. And so that's why Jesus didn't just say, hey, y'all, I love you down there. I love you. Jesus came and he told us in word and then he laid down his life for us. And so the action, he, he put his life where his words were as a heavenly father and as the glorious son. So it is action. Look at John chapter 14, 15 through 23. It says, if you love me, you will do what I say. Do you see that? It's action. It's about action. Notice the next one, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. By this we can be sure that we've come to know him. Do you want to know that you know him? If we keep his commandments. And what are his primary commands? Love God and love others. Don't be like the world. Don't love the world. Those are his commandments. Do you want to know that you're saved? Well, ask yourself, do I know what he said? You say, well, I only know what his commandments are. Well, that's why you need to study the Bible. This is why love is involves knowledge, that you may grow in knowledge. This is why you need to have a quiet time, why you need to read your Bible. This is why you need to study the Bible. This is why you need to come to men's boot camp, ladies' book club. This is why you need to come to growth group. This is why, I mean, this is, this is why you can, you can come and read and, and grow in him, spend time read, just simply growing in knowledge of him. This is what it is, how we come to know his commandments and then keep his commandments. So this involves godly living. That's one of the results. Another result is this. This is so beautiful. It's confident living. You can live confidently that if Jesus comes back tomorrow or you cash in because of a bus coming down the street, you can live confidently. You don't have to live in fear of death. You can live anticipating death. And it's not because of all that you're doing. It's because you've come to know the love of God and are simply rejoicing in his great grace in your life and obeying him. Because if you know his love, you will obey his love. So it's confident. Look what it says. So be pure and blameless for the day of Christ Jesus. This is glorious. So godly living, confident living. And how about this one? God glorifying living. And we see this, and notice the scripture that is out there to the side. God glorifying living, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. This means that your life is going to be fruitful and productive, showing the righteousness of God in your life. Now, every single one of us still have the flesh. Every single one of us still struggle with things. But let me tell you, there is this upward path that God puts us on for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we should be going and growing as we go. The glorious nature of God's goodness is bringing about a righteousness that, that comes from only Christ. And this is why Christ is at the center of everything. Look what it says there in verse 11, that you're filled with the fruit of righteousness. And look what it says after that. That comes through what? Your hard work? No, it comes through Christ Jesus. This is why Galatians 2.20 would say, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The Apostle Paul says, it's like Jesus would say in John chapter 15, you, without me, you can do nothing. But when I am in your life, Paul would say, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, it's all coming back to Jesus and his great grace and glory being lived out in our lives. So my question is this. You, we're, we're reading a passage here where a guy is obviously really loving God, and he is really loving God's people. 
And my question is this, key questions for application for you to really think about for a minute. And um, please don't pack up or anything else. I, I want you to really think about this. Do you love the church like Paul describes here? I mean, we've been reading about this. He says, I thank God for you. I yearn for you. It's right that I feel this way in my heart about you. Can you say that you love the body of Christ? Some of you would say, Pastor, I don't know anybody here. I want to encourage you to think about that. That's why we call you to come and not just come to a worship service, but to come be part of the family of Christ. Knowing that there's people here that need you. You say, Pastor, you don't know all the struggles I had. You don't know my weaknesses. You don't know what I don't know. And I say, well, come, walk with us. And what I can guarantee you is that the very things that you think are so weak and so hard about your life, that if you will let God do a work in you, that he will do a work through you, and very often precisely in your areas of struggle, precisely in your areas of weakness, because he doesn't want you to think that you've done anything. He wants you to know he's done everything. You say, God can use me? Yeah. He can use you. If he can speak through Balaam's donkey, he can speak through Andrew Coleman. And he can speak through you. Some of you are going, what's Balaam's donkey? Well, go look it up. Come learn of God. And you begin to see that, that he just calls us to love him and to love one another. And we see the Apostle Paul's life. He's pouring out his life for these Philippians. So excited about them. And my question is, do you, do you share a love like that for the church? You know, I remember when I discovered that I loved the church. And it wasn't until I was a freshman in college. I grew up in this church, first 19 years of my life. And it had never occurred to me to love the church. Church was just this thing that we did. I mean, I had people here I loved and everything else, but I didn't think about loving the body of Christ, loving that Christ had died for all these people and that these people are precious to him. In fact, these people are called the bride, his bride that he can't wait to finally be married to at the marriage supper of the Lamb when this era is over. And that he, he looks forward to us finally being with him. I hadn't really thought about all that. That he loves us this much. And that we should not only love him, but we should love each other this much. I remember starting to go, man, I really love my Christian friends and the encouragement that I have. And I really love their struggle. And I love the way they love me and my struggle. And that this is glorifying to God. God loves it when we love each other. It's kind of like you as a parent. How much does it drive you nuts when your kids fight? Do you remember that? For those of you, your kids, maybe now you have grandchildren, but do you remember when your own children would fight with each other? Man, the way to make D. Coleman get really upset, my mother, and I won't say it, but okay, but the way to make her really upset was for me and Kelly and Mark, Kelly, Mark, and I to fight with each other. That drove her nuts. It would drive her to anger. Um, as, we, as we would fight. And, and let me tell you, I, I now understand many of the things that she would say to us about how dishonoring to God that was. But this is part of growing and in, in growing that we come to love the church. Well, what about this one? Do you love the church like Christ? How much did Christ love the church? Ephesians chapter 5 tells us he loved her and he gave himself up for her. He died for her. Do you love the church like Christ? You say, but that's God. That's Jesus. How can I do that? Yes, but the Bible tells us that you've been given Jesus. You've been given the Holy Spirit. 
You have the power of God in your heart. Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that the Holy Spirit has been poured out in your heart. The love of God has been poured out in your heart that you can love. You can love the church. Some of you would say, I've never thought about loving the church. Maybe today it starts. Maybe you begin to say, Lord, help me to love the people that you love. Well, how can we do this? We see that we do this in our words, and we see that we do this, as we've said, in our actions. Do you love the church in your words? You know, there's some people, they get in the car and they complain about how cold it was in there, or they complain about, they mention money again, or they complain about so-and-so's perfume was too strong, or they complain about so-and-so shook their hand too hard, or they complain about the Sunday school teacher went too long. The preacher never goes too long. But, you know, they, they complain, and they, they, I didn't like that beat. I didn't like that sound. Didn't like that whatever it is. The pew nearly gave way when I sat down. You know, whatever it is, their words rip the church. And maybe not just the church, but the people in the church. Well, you know so-and-so, he's really not this, she's not really that. Do your words love the church or do you hurt the church? What about your actions? Do you show action that loves you? Well, I'm here, aren't I? Mm. Probably a difference in that. Have you come to serve the body of Christ? We come to engage the body of Christ. This is what it means to love with an abounding love in the grace of Christ. Would you stand with me for prayer?